one of the things that has gotten a bit lost is our understanding, our appreciation for what the term Son of Man would have meant when Jesus was out there saying it. If he's out there referring to himself more often uh, by, by this uh, nomenclature than any other, it must have meant that to Jesus it was pretty important. Is that a reasonable assumption? I think it's a reasonable assumption. If he's going to, he's choosing, this is what he's choosing to call himself, what he's choosing to refer to himself as. And he chooses more often than not, in the account that we have in the New Testament, more often than not, what he chooses to refer to himself as is Son of Man. That must have been important. It must have meant something. It must have meant something. In the New Testament, in that era in that time, nobody that was sitting there listening to Jesus when he says, I, the Son of Man, was sent to seek, to, uh, to seek that which was lost, the people listening to that weren't sitting there thinking, oh, well, because he, he has his dual nature, he must be referring to his human side now. They weren't sitting there thinking that. But my question is, what were they sitting there thinking? What were they hearing? Is there value to that? Why is he referring to himself as Son of Man? What impact did that make to their mind? Remember when we discussed this about Christ before? We said every time that they said Christ, if Jesus called himself the Christ, if someone else called him the Christ, every time they said that, that would have stung you if you had been back there, if you were a, a first century Jew who were hearing these words and going to believe these things. That would, have, that would have touched you. It would have made your ears perk up. Somebody saying, I'm the anointed one. Because for what? God has promised us a great leader. God has promised that he's going to raise up an anointed one. The prophets of old have told us over and over and over again. And when people began to realize and people began to see Jesus says to him, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Let me tell you, not only did that get Jesus' attention, so much so that he exclaims, you know, blessed you are, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. What? That I am the Messiah. The woman at the well in John 4, the Samaritan woman at the well. I know that when the Messiah, when the Christ comes, he'll teach us all things. Jesus says to her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. That got her attention. That was a Samaritan woman and that got her attention. Guess what else? It got the whole village of the Samaritans before it was over. It got all of their attention. I found the Messiah. We found the Messiah, the Christ. It meant something to them other than just being Jesus' last name. Right? Jesus Christ. It, it meant more to them. Every time they said it, it lights went off. Thus it is, I think we'll see, with this term, Son of Man. Son of Man. Let's go that. I just referred to that briefly a second ago. Luke 19. Luke, the 19th chapter. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek out and save that which was lost. Now, how many times have you heard this preached on? Of course you have, or been exhorted by this. By this. The Son of Man came to save that which was lost, the people that were lost. So we look and we say of ourselves and we look and, and we say with hope for, for mankind, we say, look, Jesus came to seek out and save the lost. He's there to help us when we're lost. He's there to help us when we're, when, when we're, uh, when we're wandering, when we're astray. And that is true. It is undoubtedly true. But in the context here, I think there's actually something even stronger that we could also appreciate, we could also learn. That Jesus is saying something not just about Zacchaeus as an individual or people as individuals when we sin and when we stray. But I think that Jesus here is actually referring to something even broader, even bigger when he refers to this about Zacchaeus Salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. 
The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. It's a Jewish audience. He's referring to sons of Abraham. He's speaking to a Jew. He's speaking among Jews. He's in a Jew's house. He himself is a Jew and he's speaking about salvation coming to the house of a child of Abraham and he uses the term son of man. Nobody in that, in that room, in that place, or if they're on their way to Zacchaeus' house or what have you, nobody in that place is sitting there thinking, oh, Jesus has just spoken about his fully human part. The context isn't about his human part and his dual nature and his God part and all. That's not the context at all. So whether, you know, whether we believe that, I don't. But whether we believe that or don't believe that, we have to admit something. That's not the issue that was on the table that day. They were talking about something else. And when he uses the term of himself, the son of man, I do believe that made their ears perk up. But what were they thinking. What was, what was being called to their remembrance? Now the Son of Man, the term Son of Man, is used a lot in the, in the Old Testament as well. One of the most common usages that you that probably you think of is among the prophets. There was one of the prophets named Ezekiel. The Son of Man is through all throughout that book. Son of man, do you see these dry bones here? Who is, who, is, who is speaking to Ezekiel? God is. And what's he calling Ezekiel? Son of man. Well, just like there are actually more than one messiahs in the Old Testament. What? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I'm talking about there are more than one anointed ones in the Old Testament. Who was an anointed one? Somebody, somebody tell me somebody who was, a, was an anointed one. Who was an anointed one? Saul was an anointed one. Uh, David was an anointed one. And what I particularly like about the usage of David is because David himself makes it very clear uh, about this idea of, of anointeds because when he speaks of Saul, he, David, who himself was anointed, Samuel came to Jesse's house, David's father, Jesse. Samuel came to Jesse's house and anointed David to be what? King over Israel. And who told him to do that? Who chose? God did. So David was God's anointed, God's chosen one. But guess what? <laughs> While that was happening, there was somebody still sitting on the throne of Israel. Who was that? Saul. And how did Saul get to be king over Israel? God chose him. Right. Samuel anointed him. So there's two anointed ones. Okay. There's a difference, though, between what we'll call regular <laughs> anointed ones, generic standard anointed ones, <laughs> but compared to the anointed one. The Messiah, the Christ. By the way, in, in, even in languages all the way back to the Greek of the New Testament, you, you can see there, there will be emphasis sometimes. There's, there's anointed ones, there's Messiah, and then there's the Messiah. And so it was, they were making that emphasis to say, we're talking about now, we're talking about uh, Messiah of Messiahs. It's an amazing thing, though, what, what we have here. It's an amazing thing. Thus it is also, why do I keep saying this? Well, thus it is also with the Son of Man. There's Son of Man and then there's the Son of Man. Well, an example of a regular old Son of Man might be the prophet Ezekiel. Regular old Son of Man, Ezekiel. Oh my goodness, prophet of God, great man of God, incredible uh, things shown to him. But there's, there's a difference between Son of Man like Ezekiel and then there's Son of Man like Daniel, the seventh chapter. Let's flip over there if we can. Daniel, the seventh chapter, beginning in verse 13. And you'll recognize this. Uh, 
I kept looking in the night vision. So who's speaking now? Daniel. It's his book, you know. <laughs> Daniel, prophet, and he's been revealed in night visions and dreams in the night, visions in the night. He's re revealed many things to him, but, uh, but see what is among the things that are revealed to, them, uh, to him is something incredibly powerful. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So it's a picture. It's a picture. And what picture is being given to Daniel? We have the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne. Who is that, by the way? That's God. And then we have this Son of Man. Now are we talking about your generic, ordinary, everyday Son of Man? Even like... Ezekiel, we're going to see in a minute because of what's described about what's going to happen to this son of man. We're not just talking about some ordinary son of man. We're talking about somebody that we could, we could say, this is the son of man. <laughs> this is son of man of son of men, of sons of men, right? All right, next verse. So he comes up before the throne, and what happens to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. So who's giving dominion, glory, and a kingdom to who? The ancient one, the ancient of days, God upon the throne, is giving to this son of man glory, dominion, and a kingdom. I ask you a question, by the way. Could this son of, would the son of man, according to what we're reading here and what, Dan, what Daniel is seeing in, in his vision, would he have had dominion? What's dominion? Dominion is what? Ownership. Ruling. Pool, power, rulership, authority, might. I mean, it's one thing. It's like David was. David had, David had the, the, uh, the throne. He had the title for years. But while Saul was chasing him all over Israel trying to keep, kill him, it was kind of hard for him to rule, wasn't it? He had the title but not the rule. You know, there's a difference between having the title and then, and then having the, the real doing it. The Son of Man that we're talking about that Daniel's describing to us according to what he saw is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And I would submit to you that if he, would not, if he had not been given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, he wouldn't have had it anyway. He wouldn't have had it. It had to be given to him. But what kind of power, to what extent, that the peoples, the nations, and the men of every language might serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Every time Jesus referred to Himself as Son of Man, it made His audience in the first century perk up and pay attention. And they weren't thinking about dual natures and stuff, and it's just referring... No, it, made the, it, got, it grabbed their attention in a powerful way. Because these prophecies of Daniel and others, but particularly this one, these prophecies of Daniel, frame this great Son of Man that God's going to bring forth in such a powerful and dynamic way. You couldn't have failed if you were a first century Jewish person to whom Jesus was speaking. You could not have failed to appreciate the impact of him referring to himself as son of man. And when you heard at Zacchaeus' house, the son of man is come to seek that which is saved and is lost. Salvation has come to this house. Those words, son of man, wouldn't have just rolled off you like water off a duck's back. They would have stuck and settled in and, and made you hear and shake and think and consider. Is Jesus is this is this man is this man referring to himself when he says, "I am the Son of Man"? Daniel was given these prophecies. He was given these visions because the nation of Israel had been disobedient, 
And if you can go, if you go on and continue to read, we won't do it right now, but if you go on and continue to read in Daniel the ninth chapter, you'll see how that Daniel begins to uh, intercede for his, for his nation, for his, for his race, for his people. He prays and calls out to God and says, we have forgotten you. He confesses his sin and the sin of the nation. He says, we've forgotten you. We've not kept your commandments. We've walked away from you. We've been disobedient for you. Where is Daniel, by the way, when he's living his life and, and having all these visions and all these things? Is he sitting, you know, is he in a in a you know in a quiet, nice little farm down in down in Galilee somewhere? Where is he living his life? In slavery, yes, in Babylon. And where is everybody else of his of his country of his kindred. Where's everybody else? Same place. If they're still alive, they're, that's where they are. Not good where they are. Not happy. Not fulfilled. And yet God is merciful and God is with them and God was with Daniel, saved him from the lion's den, but revealed to him these incredible, powerful things about what God is going to do and it centers around this one who said, this one, this son of man. Now, I'm not disputing, by the way, to go back, I'm not disputing that it does refer to Jesus as a human being when he refers to himself as son of man. What I, am, what I am saying though, it's not just a matter of we don't have to part him up in some way and say he's just referring to himself as the human part and then the son part and then the, 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 the divide by twos, take the square root and... Uh, uh. <laughs> but he is a son of man and he's not just a son of man, he's the Son of Man. Not just like He's not just a Messiah and He's not just a Christ. He is a Messiah. He is a Christ. But He's not just those things. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And He's the Son of Man. The one that God is going to use in an incredible and dynamic and powerful way to save the entire nation, to redeem all the people. And when they heard the Son of Man is here to seek and to save that which is lost, they heard the Son of Man is here to seek and save that which is lost. And they, had a, they ascribed a power to that and appreciation to that that frankly 2,000 years uh, of theological headache have blinded us to. But we need to take off our blinders and we can and we can appreciate this as well. In Daniel the ninth chapter, God is being, being very merciful because He does send an angel to Daniel and says, the, the, the minute that your supplications began to come forth, God sent me to tell you. And basically what He tells him there in the last of the 20th to the 23rd verses is, and so on, He says, you know, yes, there, there has been oppression, there's been hardship for your people, but God says, I'm going to turn it around. It's going to take 70 weeks, but I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to come to you again. The Son of Man. The Son of Man. Let's go to John, the ninth chapter. Let's look particularly now in verse 35. So to show, to show how godly and, and wonderful uh, these, these rulers and authorities were... <laughs> They drove the man who had been born blind and had the audacity to be healed on the Sabbath day. They said, you are out of our synagogue. Wow. And Jesus heard that they had put him out and he went and he found him. Imagine this. This is amazing. He went and he found him and he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man who had been born blind and had been healed by this, by this person confessed him as a prophet of God before the authorities and ended up being put out of the synagogue as a result of him. He's not going to deny Jesus or, or call him a sinner or put him down or any of those things. He's not going to speak evil of him in any way. What do you think was on his mind? When Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Oh, 
most certainly I believe in your fully, fully human part of your dual nature. Of course I do. I know I have to believe that. There was a certain council that said I couldn't go to church anymore if I didn't believe you know. No. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Actually, notice the next verse. He answered, Who is He, Lord, that I, might, that I may believe in Him? Whoa! What? He was willing to believe. He was willing to follow. He was, he was familiar with this concept of a son of man. He was familiar of this one, this great anointed, blessed one of God who had power and authority and dominion and the ability to change things and the ability to do things. He believed in that, but he wants clarification. He says, who is it that I may believe in him? In verse 37, Jesus says, you have both seen him and he is the one who is talking with you. I am that one. I am that son of man. And he says... Lord, I believe. What's he believing in? Is he believing in parts of him? Is he believing in, you know, some sort of uh, theological equation that works out to QED, blah, 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 blah? Or does he believe in the person that came to him and did something for him that no one else could do? He believes in Jesus, doesn't he? He believes in the power of Jesus, the strength of Jesus, the might of Jesus. And he worshipped him. Worshipped him as, as who? Worshipped him as who? Listen. Worshipped him as who? Worshipped him as the Son of Man. Does that mean that the Son of Man, someone, this Son of Man, is worthy of honor and glory and worship? I know there's a lot to say about worship, and I know the... God and all this thing, but notice this. He worshipped Him. And you want to tie, tie it directly to context, the one that He worshipped is the one that He is acknowledging and said, I believe that you are the Son of Man. The one who is the Son of Man is the one that He's worshipping. Think about that a little bit. Okay. He goes on, we won't go into the interchange with the, with the unbelievers, but I want to do this in, in conclusion. Let's go to Luke, the 21st chapter. We'll think about these things. We're just really kind of opening this up, this idea of Jesus as Son of Man and how powerful the Son of Man is. You know, in contemporary modern Christology, if we do ascribe to that, and the majority of the, uh, of the Christian world does, we, dis we uh, ascribe to this notion that when we're talking about the Son of God, now you're talking about the wow. And when you talk about the Son of Man, I mean, it's still great, but you're talking about the man part. And that's never going to compare to the Son of God part. So really, if you were to ask someone uh, of the two, if you're talking about the, the stronger of the two natures, the more important of the two natures, the more powerful of the two natures, the more, you know, it's like Pastor Dan was, was saying the other day on our trip, it's interesting, you know, uh, sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear Jesus referred to as the God-man. But you don't ever hear Him referred to as the man-God. How come? According to the, you know, he's fully one and he's fully the other and he's... Why don't you ever refer, hear him refer, referred to as the man God? You know why? Because that sounds funny. Guess what, guys? God man sounds funny too. The main reason it sounds funny is because nobody in here ever used that term. That's why it sounds funny. Man God sounds funny too because we tend to think, oh no, the man part, that's the, that's the lesser, the, the, the so on. No, 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 no. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to emphasize that. But in the scriptures themselves, every time we hear this name of son of man, it's not weak. It's not powerless. That's where the power is. In Daniel's vision, this son of man that is given dominion, and glory and a kingdom, a kingdom that will have no end. That's not weak. That's strength, isn't it? I think it is. 
Let's look at some of the some of the contexts in which Jesus refers to himself as Son of Man for a second. Let's think about the power of it. In Luke, the 21st chapter, verse uh, 25, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress among nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men fainting from fear, and the expectations of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Wow. How's that? Verse 27. What's going to cause all this? What's going to cause all this? Men fainting from fear. Falling back in fear. Trembling in fear. What, 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 what's going to cause all this? Because somebody's coming. But I want you to notice who's coming. Now, could it be said, the Son of God is coming in a cloud? Could, it have, could that be said? And would, would all these things, the people trembling and fainting in fear and all these things, would that be true? It's the Son of God coming. It could be, it would be. But notice the term that is used is the Son of Man is coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Whoever the Son of Man is, well, I mean, we, whoever, I mean, we know it's, it's Jesus. But, but, but the Son of Man that they talked about, the Son of Man that they heard when that term was used, the Son of Man that they expected, the Son of Man that they were waiting on, wasn't just some the weaker of the two natures guy. The Son of Man that they were expecting was the powerful, anointed Messiah Christ of God. And they didn't look at that and hear that term Son of Man and think weak side, weak part. They thought power, strength, authority, majesty, king, ruler, dominion. And so should we. Verse 28, you'll, oh, I'm sorry, verse 27, I don't think I actually read it. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Verse 28, but when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Your redemption is being brought by the advent, by the coming of who? The Son of Man. You think people are excited the way the people in the original uh, first century A.D. church, do you think people are as excited today about the coming of the Son of Man as those people were? I don't, because I don't think we know who the Son of Man really is. Talk about him being the Son of Man. He talked about himself being the Son of Man more often than not, and we are almost afraid to use the term. We should be because we don't know what we're saying. It'd be just as if you know somebody telling us, you know, you better do right by God, otherwise he might put you in a fish and not knowing the story. We don't know the story, but we should. But we should. Look at John, the 8th chapter and verse 28. We're going to just skip just, just a few of these real quickly. John, the 8th chapter and verse 28. So Jesus said... When you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. Now, in terms of immediate context, I am He, the He would refer to what? What name? What approbation? What, what title? What circumstance? When you've lifted up the Son of Man, Jesus is referring to Himself and He's using this term, Son of Man. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. The God-man. We'll know you're the God-man when we've lifted up the Son of Man. When you lift up the Son of Man, not just any Son of Man, but the Son of Man, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am He. That I do nothing of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father has taught me. He's not left me alone. And so, so, Next, Matthew, the 25th chapter. Just thinking about these things. Thinking about this Son of Man a bit. 
Matthew, the 25th chapter, and verse 31. Somebody's coming. We just read in Luke a minute ago. Some, some, the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Somebody's coming, but who's coming? When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. So if in Son of Man, Son of God, dual nature world, the Son of Man side is sort of like the weak sister, weak brother, We overlook, don't we? Because we don't appreciate the language. We overlook what Jesus Himself said. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all of the angels with Him, who's coming? The Son of Man is coming. Not just any Son of Man, the Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes and the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Whose throne? The Son of Man is going to have a throne. The Son of Man's throne. Place of authority, place of station. He will sit on His glorious throne. Who is it? The Son of Man. Finally, Matthew the 26th chapter. And let's look at this. We did not read in the book of Daniel, but it further goes on to describe these issues of the Son of Man coming in great power, seated upon clouds. And these people, we've, I, I know I'm remembering particularly that we uh, discussed the parallel between these two passages in this church uh, not too very long ago. It's been within the last, it's been within the last uh, year, I think. Time flies. But within the last year, I think, we tied these two passages together. The passage from the book of Daniel and this that takes place in Matthew 26 and verse 59. Let's look at that for a minute. Where is Jesus at this point? In Matthew 26 and verse 59, He is standing before the same religious hierarchy and the same religious authority that the man who was born blind and had the audacity to be healed. But here he is, Jesus now himself is before these same authorities, these same types of people, the chief priests and the scribes. And in verse 59 it says, Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they might put Him to death. Same type of thing that they did in, in John 9 with the, with the fellow who uh, was born blind. They finally seized on this. Oh, look, we looked at the calendar and we, all, we realized today's the Sabbath. You got healed on the Sabbath. We got you technicality. The same type of thing they were trying to do with their railroading. Just be honest about it, that's exactly what they were doing. They were trying to railroad Jesus. So they, they kept trying to get, uh, get witnesses together uh, to find something they could pin on him because it's, it's really difficult uh, really difficult to pin something on, on, a, on a completely totally innocent man. So, uh, but they did. They finally found some trumped up charges and they twisted some of his words about uh, destroying the temple and so on. And finally they said, okay, we've got him. But now we want you to testify for yourself. So they, they obtained false testimony against him so they might put him to death. But then in verse 60, they turned to him. They didn't find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Later, later on, two came forward. Uh, let's, let's drop on down. Um, uh, verse 62. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? Verse 63. Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ the Son of God. Now notice that. What he's asking Jesus to confirm is whether or not he is the Christ, the Son of God. Notice we've been talking about this difference, Christ, Son of God, and so on. He asks him specifically, if you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ, the Son of God, in verse 64, Jesus simply says, you've said it yourself. You've said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, 
So Jesus is, Jesus is taking the initiative here, really, is what he's doing. He's saying, you know, look, I, I'm done. You know, I, you're not going to pull my strings. I'm not going to be your puppet. We've already talked about that. We're all, that's already established. Yeah, I'm the Messiah. Yes, I am the Son of God. But let me tell you, what is in store for you? And it's not about weakness. It's about power and strength. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Who? Who are they going to see? Who are they going to feel? Who are they going to experience? The Son of Man. The Son of Man.